Hello everybody. Today you find me well and truly out of my comfort zone. I am behind the wheel of Nathan's 1993 Lada Reaver. I have never even sat in a Lada before today. Or if I have, I don't remember it. Now this is his pride and joy, but in all honesty, I know next to nothing about larders, so I am going to hand you over to the infinitely more knowledgeable voiceover JM, who's going to tell you a bit more about this car. The Larder Reaver was a product of the USSR and based on the Fiat 124. If you combine production numbers together, the 124 and its derivatives are the third best-selling car of all time, after the Beetle and the Model T. The car we're looking at today was known in some markets as the Vaz 2105 and is visually distinct but mechanically similar to the earlier 2101 introduced in 1970. This means that despite the model being introduced at the beginning of the 80s, it can actually trace its roots back to the 1960s and unbelievably the Lada continued in production until the beginning of the last decade where it was still built in Egypt until about 2012. As with that other communist icon, the Trabant, the aim of the Lada was cheap and accessible transport for the masses. However, it was somewhat more conventional in its construction than the East German Trabi. Even the earliest Ladas brought with them a number of significant upgrades over the base Fiat to make it more suited to the demands of Russian roads and drivers. The engine was uprated from overhead valves to overhead cam. The one we're driving today is a single carb 1.5 putting out around 75 horsepower. The Lada also gained an alternator over the Fiat's dynamo, hydraulic versus cable clutch, and several modifications were introduced explicitly to make it more durable, including thicker steel construction, a raised and uprated suspension, more jacking points, and even a skid plate as standard. So it's fair to say the car was really a re-engineering of the Fiat rather than just a rebadging. The facelifted 2105 generation Lada found its way to British shores in 1983 where it was called the Reaver and found fame as the butt of many jokes but also as affordable transport for those who just wanted a cheap, reasonably reliable car. They were the equivalent of about £10,000 in today's money but by the late 1990s new budget rivals such as Kia and Deo showed that you could have much better for less. Today's example was registered in 1993 and has a few modifications to give it the maximum communist James Bond effect. Those include a set of lowering springs, alley cat alloys, a larder front sport lip, fog lights, headlight washers, a spoiler, some very sexy rear louvers, an uprated stereo and the obligatory noisy exhaust. The car has also been gently sticker bombed to turn it into a kind of comedy party political broadcast. Right on. So hopefully I've done a reasonable job there of telling you about the vehicle. Now, what is it like to drive? Let's find out. <laughs> this massive gear lever is quite a laugh because there's so much travel in it. It's this way because its owner a couple of years ago unfortunately suffered quite a severe accident and he was unable to walk for a while. It still has some spinal issues which means that he has to make some concessions to usability with his cars. That hasn't stopped him though enjoying what he has and it's so so nice to see this kind of thing just bringing joy to people even if it means they do suffer a little bit for their enjoyment. This, I've got to admit, is actually not anywhere near like I thought it would be. Because these do date back to the 1960s, you kind of feel like it's going to drive in a very 60s fashion, and, and it doesn't. It's very bouncy, very, very bouncy, and it's not especially quick, but it's not actually that difficult to drive. I did stall it, I will confess, and when you start the car you need to make sure to give it some revs so that the uh, alternator can start doing its job properly, it'll screech a little bit, that apparently is the signal that it's working, but after that actually it's reasonably easy. Because of the different wheels on it, the Speedo is very optimistic to the tune of about 10 mile an hour. Steering though is actually really quite direct, car does move around a fair bit on the road, you can place it really easily. I love the view out the back through those louvers, that is pure motorsport. Kind of weird seeing them stuck on glass, but then if you didn't have that, this would probably just be freezing nearly all the time. Temperature is actually a bit of an issue. These cars do have a reputation for overheating because they're designed for the brutality of the Russian winter, which means that even a mild British summer 
is a little bit much for them. Because of that, in the boot you'll find a Lada Sport radiator, which wasn't actually a very expensive part, however the postage cost more than the rad itself. Generally speaking, parts availability for these isn't that bad, nor is buying them. These are, as classic cars go, quite affordable, with examples available from sort of about £5,000. Try and buy an old Ford for that much money now, you're not going to get very far. Now my usual test route unfortunately has been rather ruined, so I'm going to be taking a different road today, which I think is going to suit this car's rally heritage. I hope you enjoy the ride, because I certainly am. This is actually a little sweetie. I was really concerned that it would be absolutely anti-socially loud because the exhaust is a pretty much straight through three inch bit of pipe. However, it's not that bad. The sticker up here tells you that it's got a catalytic converter. It's rather amusing too because it warns you not to bump start the car, otherwise you'll break it. Not to switch off the ignition while the car's still moving, or you'll break it. And not to park it over any dry grass, otherwise it'll catch fire. <laughs> this one actually doesn't have a catalytic converter. The reason it's got the sticker is because the windscreen is from a much later car. Alright, this is a hill. The natural enemy of the larder. Let's go for second. At 30 mile an hour limit, but we're not troubling that at all. Going everywhere in this car takes a little bit longer than it should and is something of an event. The brake pedal does travel quite a bit before it does anything, however it's got a firmness to it and once the car does start slowing down actually it's pretty good. Clutch, once you've got used to it, is not bad either. Engine responds really quite well. A little one and a half litre single cam, 75 horses of Russian fury. I'm actually really enjoying this. Fueling isn't perfect, it does have a carburetor on it of unknown provenance. <laughs> this is for welded, absolutely welded. But that being said, I just did this road in a little Citroen C2 with 125 horsepower. And that wasn't much quicker up some of those hills. It was a bit better, of course. This is actually, for what it is, a reasonably heavy car. The reason being, they were built with thicker steel than the old Fiat equivalent. Now, I believe, and I'm sure the internet will tell me if I'm wrong, these weigh about 1,100 kilos. this magic. Come on, more power, more speed. I am doing 35 mile an hour and I feel like a hero. Where's Bonnie Tyler when you need her? This car in particular actually is really highlighted for me. One of the, the magic things about cars because it's, it's more than a machine to some people. It's more than just a, a collection of gears and levers and cogs and tyres and all that sort of stuff. You see my friend Darren who's been helping me all this week, his granddad had one of these. And I could tell the minute this car turned up, so did a lot of memories. And I know exactly what he means, I've, I've had this with other cars. You, you see a car and you are just instantly transported to a, a different time and place. That is the magic of them. I suppose for me, it's my granddad's old Vauxhall Astra van. I know a lot of people aren't fans of the, the new Top Gear with the current lineup of Flintoff, McGuinness, and Harris, but I do urge you, if there's any episode you're going to watch, try the one where they drive their dad's cars. Yes, there's some silliness and some japes and some fart jokes in there somewhere, but generally speaking, it's one of the most genuine pieces of television I've seen in a very, very long time. You can tell that all three of those guys are really taken aback by the experience. Chris Harris in particular. You, you can say what you want about the guy, and I know he got a lot of stick when he took on the Top Gear job. If you fail to be moved, 
by him when he sits in that BMW 3 Series. I don't think we can be friends. I just realised I'm probably tempting fate by, uh, by driving something Russian with loads of cameras stuck to it. I mean, that's how YouTube stays alive, isn't it? I mean, Russian dash cams are just God's gift to the world. In truth, there's only one way this could be better. So a bit more about this car specifically. Well, gear shift actually, once you've gotten used to it, the ridiculous throw of it, not that bad. Engine does respond and it gives you pretty much all it's got fairly early on. There's no real reward for revving it out. But it's okay, it's keen. It's also apparently very, very fuel efficient. We reckon on the run down today, probably achieved close to 50 to the gallon. That is not a precise figure. Please don't quote me on it. It's vague mathematics at the absolute best. It does feel more sort of maybe 80s rather than 60s or 70s. All right, so here's a question for you all then. Larder or Trabby? I just looked down there and panicked because I saw the fuel light was on. Oh, oh no, crikey, I need to get some fuel. No, no, the fuel light being on just tells you that the fan is working. It's been wired that way because it was decided that knowing the fan is operational is far more important than knowing whether the fuel is there. If you run out of fuel, it's not a problem. If you run out of fan, it might be. Most other cars I drive, if I did a road test here, I would feel like I hadn't really got the full experience. But I kind of think with this, if I drove it anywhere else, I wouldn't have got the full experience. This is a delight. You can drive it really hard, not go that fast, but it's fine. It makes the noise. It's so small that if there is oncoming traffic, I'm not too worried about it. I'm using the gearbox a lot because I'm trying to keep the revs up, keep the car moving. Also, it's kind of fun now I've gotten used to it. Yeah, under braking, wants to go left very badly. I can more or less go around that bend on the brakes. <laughs> so Nathan, curiously, went looking for something very, very different. You see, he wanted a car that was desperately underpowered, made to a dubious standard, and from a former superpower. He was looking at a Corvette C3. I was going through the classifieds one day, just on uh, Facebook Marketplace and things like that. I was looking through at different cars and whatnot, and um, for some reason, one of these was shown up and listed simply as a car. And the minute he realized what it was, he just thought, I have to have that. Absolutely have to have it. And you know what? <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it. The Trabi is, is a much more agricultural, unrefined thing. This does actually feel a bit like a car. I can see if, you know, back in the 70s or 80s, you didn't have very much money, why you, you would consider one of these because the other cars available to you weren't really that much better. Driving the wheels off this thing, and I'm not quite keeping up with a Vauxhall Insignia. It's brilliant. Brakes I'm kind of getting used to, but there's always that initial first press and you go, ah, are they doing anything? Discs at the front and a massive drum at the rear, way bigger than a disc. It's actually quite comfortable. It is, it is bouncy as all hell, but it is kind of comfy. See, actually, for driving around in modern traffic in there, it's the sort of stop-start, low-speed stuff, where often these cars are not very good. And this is fine. Yeah, the interior is all basic and a bit naff, and you do need to do some work if you want them to really be semi-reliable in, in the modern world, and even then, they will only ever be sort of 60% reliable. But, such is the life of the classic car owner. One of the nice things about the Lada is that they are a car which was made in very great quantities. Therefore, parts availability is good, prices are reasonably low, and whatever you want to do with them, somebody's worked it out. However, because they are an unusual thing in this country, you get that whole kind of, what's that? Oh, this is unusual kind of thing. Um. 
many people also have great stories or memories like Darren of family that had one or maybe they themselves had one many moons ago and that is a real joy of car ownership you know sometimes it's not just about the car itself but the the memories attached to it the experiences you had the places you went the people you knew to some people this is just a car door to others it's a gateway to the past Darren won't sit in this he can't this is a special car really properly special I like this I really like this larders were the butt of jokes at school if one of my friends dad had a larder oh oh dear oh dear but nah I love this as we would have said back in the 90s it's wicked thanks for watching comrades please like comment down below subscribe if you haven't already We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.